Okay. Mm. Wonderful. What a lovely kind of worship. One of these thin places where you just get a real sample of heaven and God's love. So thanks to the worship there. So that's what we that's the chemical that's released when we have pleasurable experiences. Even to even that the likes that we get on Facebook or Instagram, it releases that happy hormone. And research suggests that um, dopamine can help stimulate learning, and that if we actively seek it on a regular basis, that we'll enjoy happier and healthy lives. And I think that we've sampled this a lot during lockdown. Now, notwithstanding the huge grief and destruction and devastation that the virus has brought, a word that was often used in those opening months was actually lockdown's a bit of a novelty. Working from home, spending extended time with family, getting to do stuff that we don't normally get to do. And um, Pliny the Elder, wonderfully named Pliny the Elder, who was an influential figure in the Roman Empire, he says this, it is the nature of man to long for novelty. And that's why I think you know, that companies will repackage brands, because it will capture your, catch your eyes and you'll be more likely to buy it. Apple, for instance, they bring out an iPhone every single year. They know that the people that bought it a year ago are going to buy it again, because they're hard wired to enjoy new things. But don't be will drop and the new things that we buy, the novelty will wear off and they will lose their function. I'm sure there's many things in our homes that we bought five years ago, maybe even a year ago, that's stuck in a corner, gathering dust and maybe doesn't even work anymore. And to go back to that lockdown example, when lockdown three arrived, the novelty had wear, worn off completely. But like, goodness sake, I want to get back to normality. And scripture speaks into this. Paul in Romans 8 says that creation is groaning, it is decaying. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says that we're wasting away. We're not getting any younger. Try as we might to avoid this, to ignore this, we aren't getting any younger. But there is good news. There is good news. Now, depending on your uh, Bible translation, there are around 60 references to the word new in the New Testament. The majority of which are in the context of the new life given through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And the majority of these references are the Greek word kindness, K A I N O S, which means new as to form or quality of different nature from what is contrasted as old. So that's new is to formal quality, of different nature from what is contrasted as old. So this is brand spanking new. This is fresh. And this term is used for new covenant that Jesus has brought about. The new creation that we all are in Christ Jesus. There's the new commandment that Jesus gave us to love one another as we love ourselves. In Ephesians, Paul talks about us being a new person, that we're part of this new humanity. Revelation talks about us being given a new name. When Jesus returns, you are going to get a new name. 
by God. How exciting and thrilling is that? And then at the end of the scripture, Revelation chapter 21, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Why? Because God is making all things new. The New Testament is soaked in this idea of newness. It's in the name. I think God is wanting to get something across. And if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to John chapter 19. And we'll spill over into John chapter 20. This is one of the resurrection passages. So John chapter 19, beginning from verse 38. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus secretly because he feared the Jews. And with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, a man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And then into chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord, the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in, and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went to Simon. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had arrived. Verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you would carry him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbanai, which means Jesus. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. I mentioned earlier that word kindness, and it's referenced in this passage um, in regards to the tomb. The new, it was a brand new tomb. And that might seem not too consequential, but at, in the first century Palestine at the time, Tombs were used for whole families, so it'd be unusual for someone to be put in a brand new tomb. But this was a brand new tomb, and it was from this new tomb that new life emerged. And we see so many other references to this idea of newness in this passage. When does this happen? When does the resurrection of Jesus happen? It's first thing in the morning. So early that when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, it's dark. It's a brand new day. And it's on the first day of the week, a brand new week. And what's the location of this tomb? It's a garden. A garden is a place full of new life. And throughout all of this, we are seeing echoes of Eden. We go right back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. God creates the heavens and the earth. And what is created? 
on the first day of the week, light from darkness. Jump forward to Resurrection Sunday, light from darkness. These are clear allusions to the beginnings of creation. And where is the Jesus that God first walks with Adam and Eve? And Adam and Eve enjoy that intimate communion with him. It's in a garden. But sadly, the fall came. Sin came, death entered the world, and Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden, and guarding the gateway to Eden are angels, cherubim. And here in this passage that I've just read, Mary Magdalene, she's grieving. She wonders where Jesus is, who greets her and tells her the good news of Jesus' resurrection. Two angels. These are clear parallels to the beginnings of creation, because that is the cosmic shaping work that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection has done. It has taken us back to the start, to that moment, to that place where the world was all it was meant to be, when there was no sin, there was no death, where Adam and Eve, they enjoyed that intimate communion with God, where they would live forever, where every moment was full of novelty because there was no decay, there was no pain, there was no destruction. Why? Because there was no sin. And what Jesus' resurrection means, after being nailed to the cross, where he takes on the weight of the sin, of our sin, the sins of the whole world, and he takes that ultimate consequence and punishment, which is death. And three days later, he rises from the dead. That resurrection is him overcoming sin and overcoming the great enemy that is death. And it is something that we all share in today. And this affects not just the whole world, not just our whole, our whole lives, but the entire cosmos. This is an earth shattering. This is cosmic shattering. That is the magnificence of what Jesus' resurrection means for us. He has taken us back to the start, as if sin and death never entered in the first place. We're going back to the start, to the way God always wanted and intended for us to live. Graham Tomlin, I saw this in a tweet this morning, he wrote this, If the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen, then the death of Jesus is the end of Christianity. If it did happen, it's the beginning of a new world. That is the magnitude and magnificence of this moment. The wonderful view of Jesus. So novelty gives us that dopamine hit. And it will fade. And the question I want to ask all of us today is, is that, does the unrivaled novelty of knowing Jesus give you the greatest thrill in your life? Because that is what it is. An unrivaled novelty that gives us a new start to death, that changes the way that we live our lives, and gives us an eternity where every moment is one novelty after another. Because there's no sin, there's no death, there's no pain. Unrivaled novelty of Jesus give us the greatest thrill in our lives. If it does, it's because we grasp what Jesus has done. And if it doesn't, go deeper, get to know Jesus more, and realize what a wonderful thing that Jesus has done for us that affects everything. So, what does this mean more? On a, on a daily, practical level for us. The first thing is that it gives us a new start. There's something lovely about starting something afresh. Even if it's a brand, you know, you've had a terrible Monday, Monday's a terrible day, everything's gone wrong, just nothing's gone right, and then you go to bed and you think, I'm going to start afresh on Tuesday, go again. There's something nice about starting that day afresh, going again. Or if you're starting a new job, or you start, you're moving to a new home, a new town, just starting a new chapter. There's an excitement, a freshness in that. A clean, a clean slate, a fresh start. Do we know and have we experienced 
the fresh new start that Jesus gives each and every one of us. I talked earlier about creation groaning, and that is something that we're not absolved from. We all feel it, we feel it physically. And I think that if we're here today, we're probably feeling it spiritually as well. That acute sense of our own failings, our own weaknesses, our own propensity to mess up, and the way that that hurts us, the way that that hurts others, and the way it hurts our relationships with others, and ultimately God, who is holy, loving, holy, perfect, awesome. Uh, there was a newspaper editorial many years ago that asked the question, what's wrong with the world? And J.K. Chesterton, famous Christian author, wrote back with just two words, I am. I am. And if we are truly true to ourselves, I think we'd agree with that. We long for justice in the world. We watch the news, we read the newspapers, so much suffering and wickedness, and we want justice. And that in itself is the sign of the, the divine in us. We long for that. But do we long for justice in our own lives? That as we look to God, we see how wonderful he is. And as we look at ourselves in comparison and, and, and our sin, how we, we mess up, but also how we recognise actually we're, we're made for something greater. Ecclesiastes, we're, we're made with eternity in our hearts. We're created for something bigger than, than just this world. That longing, that sense that there is a divine out there that we are meant to worship and adore and serve. But we've fallen short because of our sin. And then if we recognise that, we see the reality of where we're at and the reality of God, then we will know Actually, there needs to be a consequence to the things that I do, say, think that aren't good. There needs to be a punishment. And this is where Jesus comes in. When he's nailed onto that cross, on his shoulders is your sin. Everything that you've ever done, said, or thought that was not right, on his shoulders, as if he were the very person that commits them in the first place. And he nails that sin to the cross so that we don't have to carry it anymore. And then he rises again three days later, victory over sin, victory over death, so that we can enjoy relationship with God as Adam and Eve did way back at the beginning of creation. So that we can be the people that he made us to be. And so that we can enjoy eternity forever. Jesus says, let me take care of the rubbish, the places where you've messed up, and go and enjoy the wonderful relationship you can have with my Father, God the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Let me take care of the rubbish. Let me take care of your guilt, your shame, your wrongdoing. And enjoy my Father. Enjoy eternity. He takes care of the punishment of sin and the ultimate consequence of that, death. What a thought that is. Have you enjoyed, and are you enjoying, the new start given to you by Jesus? Or are you feeling weighed down by guilt, shame, that knack that we have for messing up? Know that you can come to Jesus and says, I take care of that so that you don't have to. And the wonderful thing is, you can have a new start with Jesus every day, Every minute, every moment, that, that time we think, oh, I've done it again, I've hurt such and such, I've let God down, or whatever, Jesus is like, come to me, admit where you've gone wrong, accept your, acknowledge your need for me, enjoy my Father, enjoy new life with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Are you enjoying that new start with Jesus that he has given you? Don't let it go. Don't let it go. Second thing, new life. 
when we get new things, we, we tend to take extra care of them, don't we? Particularly if they're pricey and expensive. I keep away from it. Get your crummy hands off it, that kind of stuff. Uh, a couple of months into lockdown, I bought a brand new desk because it was clear that I'd be working at home. Did my research, got this fairly sort of minimalist desk, plenty of leg room, and it's got a nice wooden finish. Now, two years on, I still take ultra good care of this desk. You know, I've got my coaster so no, no drinks can go on it. Uh, it's part of my cleaning routine on a weekly basis. Yes, it is. And if there's any knock, if something knocks against it, I immediately look, oh, is that okay? Is that okay? I'm very precious about this desk. Okay. Um, clearly. And I think that's true of the new things that we have. But we, we, are, we want to make sure they're okay, that we don't damage them, that they're, they remain pristine for as long as possible. So are we taking care of the new start given to us given to us by Jesus? Are we taking care of the new start given to us by Jesus? Romans 6, verse 4, Paul says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we may too live a new life. It's basically saying that the new start that you've been given by Jesus must result in a new way of doing life. He picks up it, uh, on it again in Colossians chapter 3. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge of in the image of its creator. And he, here Paul talks about putting on kindness, putting on compassion, putting on forgiveness. So we're following the example of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, when, when we give our lives to Jesus, he comes in and he, he does that refining work in our lives. He, he's making us more like Jesus, but he cannot do it alone. We've got our part to play. We've got to be proactive in seeking to live godly lives, following the example of Jesus, putting on those virtues, putting on those new practices and behaviour, allowing the Holy Spirit to do his thing at work in us. And it extends to so many other things. I love the imagery in scripture about how Jesus dwells in and through us. We're talking, we hear of um, streams of living water flowing through us. But we are the aroma of Christ. And it all taps into this idea that we have resurrection power in us, flowing through us. That as we pray for people, things happen. As we speak, we carry the words of God. That as we live our lives, it impacts people. Not because of anything wonderful that we've done. It's Jesus in and through us. It's part of our new life. But we've got a responsibility to join with the Holy Spirit in doing, in bringing that new life in and through us. So as you look back on your life before you became a Christian, even as you look on your life maybe 12 months ago, 6 months ago, have you seen change? Paul talks about us being renewed day by day. We should be growing. And if we look back on those times when we're not seeing that we're living in a, in a different way, a new life, but we're not seeing that growth. We've got to ask ourselves why that is. And go back to the start and to the new start that Jesus has given us. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. He's given us everything we need to take care of the new start that Jesus has given us. It's like that new thing that you bought, and it's come with a manual, it's come with some replacement bits and bobs, it's got a phone number that you can call people if there's a problem with it. You've got everything to basically take care, good care of the new thing that you bought. That's what God has given us, from a far, far deeper and more wonderful level. The new life. Jesus, living with Jesus. And finally, new creation. I, I began earlier by talking about the new things that, that we all enjoy. And if you're anything like me, as you can probably tell by now, I love getting new things. Uh, if, if I know that something new is coming, or I'm going out to get something, I'm a bit excited. 
is coming. This week, Wednesday, is arriving. Um, that thrill, that excitement, novelty. Do we have, I mean, is our greatest thrill in terms of what is coming is for the new heavens and the new earth, of what is coming? Because looking at the Bible, and when it talks about, about the new heavens and the new earth, this is something to get so excited about. So excited about. Let me read from Revelation chapter 21, just so in these words. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no one in the sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order has passed away. He who was seated, was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, these words are trustworthy and true. In Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus talks about the renewal of all things. And we see that elaborated upon in that passage that I just covered. And the word, the Greek word for renewal is palingenesia. Palingenesia. It's, a, it's two words put together. Palen, which is again, genesia, birth. Born again. Creation born again. We're going back to Eden. And what is the turning point in this? Who is the turning point? It's Jesus. It's his death and his resurrection. And that is where we're going. We're still in this world and there's still sin, there is still, still death, but the kingdom of heaven is breaking through and will culminate the climax in that wonderful moment when Jesus returns and the new heavens and the new earth are here. This is such an exciting possibility and one that scripture implores us to look forward to. Because it's a game changer when we have that perspective. C.S. Lewis says this, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most of the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. And Paul had this perspective. You know, he went through all of this suffering, shipwrecked, stoned, thrown out of town. But he said it's a mere trifle compared to what is coming, to the glory of what's coming. He said to, to, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He knew what was coming and he gave him strength to persevere amidst the suffering and the drudgery of everyday life. And it fueled his mission because he wanted everyone else to know about it. And he wanted to bring those droplets of heaven to earth because the kingdom of God was breaking in through Jesus and he wanted to be part of that. And so, friends, let's look forward to the new heavens, the new earth, the new creation. Let, and let that be a game changer in terms of it giving you the strength to persevere through the difficulties, knowing that this will not last. Eternity is coming. And this life that we live now is but a breath. And let it fuel your mission to take, tell others about him. That's what we see in the, the passage I read earlier. That invitation to go and tell others. We have this wonderful news, the unrivaled novelty of knowing Jesus. We can't keep it to ourselves. And if we focus ahead on what is coming, we will be driven. Because we can't keep it to ourselves. It's too good, in, good news to keep to ourselves. And to return to C.S. Lewis, um, at the end of his series of Narnia, The Last Battle, there is a lovely close to the story, where life in Narnia is coming to a close, but there is a, a wonderful beginning coming. This is what it said, and he, Aslan spoke, as he spoke, sorry, Aslan no longer 
looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this, the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. This is coming. Beginning. Chapter 1 of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. The unrivaled novelty of knowing Jesus and spending eternity with him. Paul just talks about, doesn't he? No eye has seen, no mind can conceive what God has prepared for those who love him. For you. He goes and prepares a place for you. It's coming. It's coming. So do you know the thrill and excitement of knowing Jesus and the new thing that he has done in your life and in our world? Grasp it and let it fuel your love for him and your service to him and radically shape your life. And I will finish with Lamentations chapter 3, that wonderful verse about newness. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. But his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for them. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Every day you wake up, Fresh love from the Father is yours. It is yours. Let's just take a moment of quiet as we reflect on the new life given to us through Jesus. That new start, the new life that asks of us, and the new creation that is to to life in us.